1927, most of the physicists doing research in the field of quantum mechanics viewed it as a completed work. While the applications of the theory would be a rich vein of scientific research to mine for years to come, most of the theoretical effort had been finished with the publication of the Dirac equation. This, however, didn't mean that the nature of matter was well understood. Only that the types of transitions an electron might make in an atom could be predicted with some confidence. The next step, everyone realized, was to be able to describe how a charged particle such as an electron interacted with the environment surrounding the atom. The men who had been mostly responsible for laying out the framework of quantum mechanics went to work to understand this interaction. Most notably, Dirac, Heisenberg, and Pauli set out to recast the electromagnetic field in a way that was consistent with the work they had already done and found an entirely new way of thinking about the fundamental nature of matter. Hello and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom. Episode 18, A Fields and... So... In the last several episodes, I've hinted that the next step in physics was in looking at interactions between very small, charged, subatomic particles and the electromagnetic field. This next step, known as quantum field theory, takes us right up to the edge of our history of the atom. From this point onwards, we're not dealing with the atom per se, but rather the things that make it up and that hold it together and that hold it to other conglomerations of subatomic particles that we also call atoms. To get started with this, let's take a moment to gain a little altitude and review the landscape. In 1927, the communities of physics and chemistry knew that all matter was made up of atoms and that atoms were made of even smaller things, namely protons in a very small and dense nucleus, and electrons that were bound to that nucleus, but whose motion was very difficult to describe in terms of classical physics. They knew that protons were positively charged, and electrons were negatively charged, and that the electrostatic attractions between them were, at least in part, responsible for holding the atoms together. They also knew that when an electron is, was bound to a proton, it can be said to be in a quote-unquote state that could be characterized by certain quantities that were said to be quantized in that these quantities, things like energy and angular momentum, were found to have to be in discrete, specific multiples of some fundamental value. When the electron interacted with this environment, the state could be changed only by these discrete amounts. These states and the transitions between the states could be calculated using a variety of methods known as quantum mechanics, which were developed by Heisenberg, Schrodinger, and Dirac. In 1932, Chadwick further clarified the picture with the discovery of the neutron, something that allowed researchers like Bohr and Gamow to better describe the processes taking place in the nucleus of the atom, a topic we'll return to in a later episode. What wasn't as well understood was how to describe the interaction of the electron with the surrounding environment. To put it briefly, the groups from Copenhagen to Zurich, Göttingen to Cambridge, knew that the interaction could produce state transitions, but they didn't really understand how. To try to figure this out, they recognized that they would have to describe the electron's interaction with the electromagnetic field it was in. In order to do this, they realized that they needed to quantize the field itself, hence the name of the new approach, quantum field theory. In order to understand what men like Heisenberg, Pauli, and Dirac did, we need to backtrack quite a little bit in order to understand what is meant by the word field 
in the context of physics, and then to apply that understanding to what it means to have an electromagnetic field. Once we do that, we can get into the work done between 1927 and about 1934, and then beyond that. Okay, so what's a field? You've probably heard the term used with some sort of modifier in the past something like a magnetic field or a gravitational field. In physics, a field is a description of any physical quantity that exists and possibly changes at all points in space in a region. The simplest type of field one might imagine would be what we might call a temperature field. In the room you're sitting in, every point in space has a certain temperature that can be measured. That measurement might yield a higher value towards the ceiling and a lower value near the air conditioning vent at the floor. By the way, it's summertime here in Georgia as so I record this, so air conditioning is a very important and notable source for an example right now. The measurement tells you something about the physical state of the environment at that point. In this case, the average speed of the gas molecules in the vicinity of the point. The first person to really think in terms of fields, especially with respect to things that might exert forces, was Michael Faraday, someone we discussed way back in the episodes on the chemical and electrical atom. Faraday first introduced fields in order to solve a couple of problems he was having. The first was the objections he had with what we call action at a distance forces. Usually, when you think of exerting a force on something, a force being a push or a pull on an object from the environment. You think of one thing being in physical contact with another. When I mow my lawn, my hands have to push on the handle of my lawn mower to cause it to move forward. The same is true if you lift a box with a rope or a cable. The cable has to be touching the box in order to exert a force on it. The problem for Faraday was that this contact model didn't seem to be how people thought about the forces between two charged objects. If you had two positively charged insulating spheres, each hay hanging from its own string, and you tried to bring those two spheres close together, they would repel each other without having to touch. By the way, if you have some cellophane tape, in other words, scotch tape to use the common name brand, you can replicate this experiment pretty easily. All you have to do is find a hard linoleum counter and put it down about a 10 centimeter piece of tape. On top of that, put a second 10 centimeter piece of tape and then pull that off quickly. Hang that second piece of tape from the edge of the countertop. Repeat this process to produce another hanging tape. If you bring the two tapes close together, you should be able to see them repel from each other. Take a few minutes to try this if you can. I think it's pretty cool. All right, back to the discussion. A French natural philosopher by the name of Charles Augustin de Coulomb had been the first to characterize this force of attraction or repulsion by charges in 1784. And his description had the forces acting at a distance, i.e., the two charges didn't actually have to touch each other. Now, about 50 years after Coulomb's description of the force between two charged particles, Faraday was bothered because it didn't make sense to him why these types of forces would be different than the typical contact type forces. So he came up with a different way to describe how the force was created. What he said was that a charged particle created an electric field everywhere in the space around it. This electric field changed the space in which it existed in such a way that if a second charged particle was placed at a given point, the electric field at that point would create the electric force on the second charge. In shorthand, charges create electric fields. Electric fields then exert forces on other charged objects. Faraday said that you couldn't see this field directly because your senses couldn't observe it. But what you could observe was the effects the field had on other charged objects. While this is harder to do with electrical objects, it's actually pretty easy to do with magnetic ones. Nearly everyone has seen a picture of iron filings lined up along the magnetic field of a bar magnet. If you haven't seen that or don't quite remember what it looks like, go to the podcast webpage, The Scientific Odyssey, 
www.typepad.com and you'll find a picture of it there. The type of field that you'll be looking at is what is known as a dipole field since there are two magnetic poles, one north and one south. You can create the same kind of electric field configuration with two oppositely charged electrical objects. This would be known as an electric dipole. A water molecule is an example of something that forms an electric dipole because the oxygen atom in the molecule tends to hog the electrons it shares with each of the hydrogen atoms in the covalent bonds that hold the atom together. Another example of a field is the gravitational field. Now in this case, what we have is it's the mass of an object that creates the field that affects other masses. Each of these fields, electric, magnetic, and gravitation, are known as vector fields because the field has both a size or magnitude and a direction at every point in space. Faraday's field description was mocked at first by other researchers as they thought it was merely an artifice used by him to compensate for his mathematical deficiencies. They didn't think it was a real thing, even though it could be used to account for a number of observations relating electric and magnetic phenomena. It wasn't until James Clerk Maxwell was able to show that electricity and magnetism were really different expressions of the same physical phenomenon, and that light was actually a wave in the electromagnetic field that the field idea was truly taken seriously by most physicists, even if they were perplexed by what the field really represented. Maxwell's description of light as an electromagnetic wave was a breakthrough of startling breadth, as it was able to account for Young's double slit experiments of about 60 years earlier, along with a number of other things. The problem was is that it didn't actually work in certain cases the way Newton's law said it should. Interestingly, Einstein's special theory of relativity grew out of Einstein's work to rectify this inconsistency between the two frameworks, Newton's and Maxwell's. What was understood in the late 1920s was that the electron in a hydrogen atom was a charged particle moving in the electric field of the positively charged proton that was the nucleus of that atom. The electron could absorb and emit discrete photons of light, which seemed to be quantized packets of electromagnetic energy. This absorption and emission caused the electron to transition from one state to a different state and accounted for the various types of spectra observed in nature. The problem was that while these transition were quantized, the physical properties of the electron and photon were quantized, and the interaction of the electron with the photons of light was quantized, the electric field that the proton was a part of and that the electron seemed to be interacting with was not quantized. That's the problem that Nobbin physics turned to to try to address in 1927 as the various techniques of quantum mechanics seemed to settle in. And when I say Nobbin physics, I of course mean Heisenberg, Dirac, and Pauli, but there were others. Most notably, there was Heisenberg's colleague Pasquale Giordan, who was Born's primary postdoctoral fellow in Göttingen. There were also students of Heisenberg and Pauli, as well as Oppenheimer in the United States, and a new up-and-coming Italian by the name of Enrico Fermi. Like Einstein and Schrodinger, Dirac didn't, generally didn't take many students, and during the time where he worked on field theory, he seems to have worked more or less alone. As I mentioned in an earlier episode, it was around an expanding center of German theoretical physics, beginning with Born and Bohr, that the work in quantum field theory developed. So how did these men proceed in their work? As you will recall, Dirac's generalization of Heisenberg's matrix mechanics had shown that if a set of quantities could be shown to be non-commuting or, in mathematical terms, have a non-zero Poisson bracket, 
then the system in which those quantities existed must display quantum behavior. It was felt that the electro electromagnetic field should be quantized, and so the three Nobbin physics set out to discover the non-commuting properties that would allow for the quantum nature of the field to be characterized. Unfortunately, it wasn't going to be as simple as it had been for the electron. In its classical analog, the electron has certain physical properties like position and momentum, and it turned out that Heisenberg had stumbled upon the non-commutivity of those two properties. The electromagnetic field didn't have such easily identifiable classical properties to latch onto. Dirac and Heisenberg tried a number of things until they came upon the notation that a specific pair of mathematical operators formed the non-zero Poisson bracket and that discovery unlocked a whole new vista of possibility and understanding. So there's a lot to unpack in that last sentence. Most importantly, the idea of an operator. Let me see if I can do that in a way that doesn't get too confusing, but that also preserves some of the important mathematical meaning of the work. In this explanation, I would like to thank a couple of colleagues, Drs. Frank Daniels and Stephen Carden, who have been kind enough to lend a hand to make sure I don't mess this up too badly. A mathematical operator is a process that takes one or more mathematical objects and turns them into one or more objects that are possibly of a different type. To understand this definition, it's probably helpful to think of a few very specific mathematical operations to sort of give you a sense of this. To start with, there are the familiar arithmetic operators, plus, minus, multiply, and divide, and the operations that they perform. Each of these operators takes a pair of numbers and turns them into a single new number. So. Addition is the operation where you take one number and add it to another number and get a third new number. The plus symbol represents the operator that performs the operation. The next level up might be something like the derivative operator for those who might have taken a calculus course. This operator turns a mathematical function, say something like a parabola, into a different function expressing the slope or rate of change of the original function. In the case of a parabola, the new function would be the equation that represents a straight line on a graph. In quantum mechanics, which often deals with the probability of finding a particle in a particular location or state, one might work with something called the expectation operator, which takes the probabilities that a wave function might take on certain values and turns it into an average of a sort. This is an example of an operator that gives a different type of mathematical object. So what was discovered, really by Heisenberg and Pauli in the early 1930s, based off work started in 1927-28 by Dirac, was that there were a pair of operators that acted on a wave function that described how the electron interacted with the electromagnetic field it was embedded in. One of the operators was called the creation operator because it acted to create a new energy state in that interaction, while the other operator was called the annihilation operator because it acted to destroy or remove an energy state. Another way to think of each of these operators is that they are a set of instructions as to how the system would, through the interaction of the particle field, i.e. the electron, with the electromagnetic field, create or destroy a particle. Interestingly, this particle or state had the exact mathematical properties of the photon. Now, if you act on the wave function with the creation operator first and then the annihilation operator second, you create an energy state and then you destroy it and you're back to where you started. You'd think that if you performed the operations the other way around, destroy a state and then restore it, you'd end up with the exact same thing. But what was found is that the order in which the operators were applied mattered, and that meant that the interaction of the electron's wave function with the electromagnetic field was quantized, and that quantization corresponded with the creation and emission or absorption and destruction of a photon. This is a really profound result for several reasons that I'd like to discuss. First, how did Dirac, Heisenberg, and Pauli know that they are, in some sense, on the right track with this approach? 
especially given the very radical nature of the outcome. The first really strong evidence comes from work Heisenberg and Pauli do in around 1930-1932 that shows that this quantum description of the electromagnetic field and its interaction with the electron can be shown to give the exact results predicted by Maxwell's equations for the classical case. The math to show this result is enormously complex, but the key payoff is that quantum field theory does not give absurd, absurd results when applied to already understood systems. Now I'd like to take an aside here for just a second. I can't tell you how important this kind of test is, both in the history of modern physics and as a general technique in science. In the very first sense, every single example of an advance from the 19th century classical physics to the 20th century modern physics has, as one of the supporting pillars of that work, this property that the new theory reduces to the older, classical one when the proper classical assumptions are made. Special and general relativity reduced to Galilean relativity and Newtonian mechanics when the velocity of the systems are very slow or the masses are fairly small, for example. More broadly, though, in science, there's a common practice that when a new method of computation or theory is first put forward, it is applied to systems or problems where the answers are already well known and understood. The new approach must reproduce these results before it can be thought to be reliable enough to apply to novel systems or problems where the behaviors are not well understood or even known. For example, when I was modeling galactic evolution using computer codes, one of the approximation methods we were using was fairly new. If we had just tried simulating galaxies using the new approximation, we wouldn't have known if our results were an actual behavior of the system or an artifact of untested code and approximations. Therefore, we used the code to do calculations on systems where we had a good analytic understanding of the behavior. And when the new computer code, with its approximations, reproduced the analytical predictions with a high level of accuracy, it gave us a lot of confidence that any results we got from simulating the not as well understood galactic systems could be trusted. This is a key tool scientists use, especially when developing new tools of observation and analysis, something that is vital as more and more complex physical processes are being modeled using powerful computing techniques. The second thing to understand with these creation and annihilation operators is that combinations of operators are also operators. What Pauli and Heisenberg are able to do is, in essence, rewrite the Schrodinger and Dirac equations not as wave equations, but in terms of these new operators and their combinations, something that gives new insights into both the quantum mechanics of the mid-1920s, but also into just what's going on in terms of the particle field interactions being described in Dirac's first attempts in the 1920s, late 1920s actually, that gave rise to the quantum field approach. This, combined with the commutation relationship we've already discussed, allows for a generalization of the position momentum commutation formulism in the original quantum mechanics that can be applied to a much broader class of systems. In other words, what is shown is that the P times Q minus Q times P case that led to matrix mechanics and then to Dirac's generalization of that to all classical particle-based quantum systems is actually just a special case of an even broader way of looking at systems of not only particles but that also involve fields as well. As such, this method will be able to be applied not only in the case of a charged particle such as an electron interacting with an electromagnetic field, but to any particle having an appropriate property of matter interacting with any type of field that sort of couples with that property of matter. This will be the basis of Heisenberg's work in 1933 and 1934 in nuclear physics that attempted to develop a field theory approach to the interaction between the protons and the newly discovered neutrons in the nucleus, as well as an attempt to understand and explain beta decay, a topic we'll deal with in much greater detail in a later episode. The third thing that this approach implies 
is that there needs to be a redefinition of the idea of what matter is. In the classical world, matter is something that is stable and doesn't change. This is explicitly stated in Lavoisier's law of conservation of mass, that matter cannot be created or destroyed in chemical reactions. It's one of those absolute bedrock things that Dalton develops his model of the atom on. In this picture, one, by the way, that can be traced all the way back to Democritus. Physical processes can be thought of as sort of a dance of atoms with chemical change occurring when either entire atoms or, in some cases, their constituent electrons change places or find new partners, like some sort of microscopic square dance. This redefinition of matter that we're talking about had already begun with Einstein's special theory of relativity in 1905 when he showed the equivalence of mass and energy. But the theory was usually only used to express that mass could be converted into energy. The truly symmetrical picture of mass being converted to energy and energy being converted to mass would have to wait until Dirac's equation with its prediction of matter-antimatter creation and annihilation and Anderson's observational discovery of the that process in cosmic ray decay. What is important here, though, is that now the energy can be given off by a system or absorbed back into it. With the particular example of the photon in the electron electromagnetic field interaction, this creation or absorption of matter, i.e. the photon, involves energy only. The photon is not considered to have its own inherent rest mass, as it's called. Thus, rest mass becomes just another property of matter, or matter energy, on equal footing as classical properties like charge and angular momentum, quantum properties like spin, or things that are even more exotic, such as strangeness or what physicists call color. Moreover, the important idea in systems stops being mass or even matter, but rather energy which, at times, is expressed as matter, but at other times will be seen in systems in fundamentally non-material forms. On a philosophically ontological level, this is a profound new distinction that clearly breaks with the classical idea of atoms having mass as being the fundamental reality of physical systems. A fourth thing to be noted is that as the mathematical work is developed in the earlier 1930s, it is recognized that the creation operator for the electron can also be thought of as the annihilation operator for the other pair of states from the Dirac equation and vice versa. It is this realization that moves Dirac away from his conceptualization of those two unaccounted for states as holes in an electron C and towards the idea of the states being a new anti-electron. Moreover, this recognition means that for any particle that interacts with a field of some sort, there would have to be an antiparticle to go with it. We'll return to this idea in a later episode as the implications of this as to what antimatter particles might be are re-examined by the physicists of the 1940s and 50s, most notably Richard Feynman. The fifth and final thing I'd like to talk about as a consequence or result of the formulation of quantum field theory is that it is able to provide an explanation for what forces actually are. Teased out from the work of Pauli and Heisenberg in 1932 by Enrico Fermi, this description of how and why objects are able to interact with each other solves a question that dates all the way back to Isaac Newton's. One of the things that no one really understood was what really caused the force to be exerted. While Faraday's fields, as classically formalized by Maxwell, provide a sort of intermediate description of the process, it didn't really explain why a field should push on something. In the quantum electrodynamics version of field theory, this problem was really solved. What the theory showed was that when an electron interacted with an electromagnetic field, it could excite a state that created a photon. This photon, which was made of, from the energy excited in the field and which carried momentum, would travel in the direction of the source of the field, say another electron. That electron would annihilate the photon by absorbing it. 
What's important here is to understand what the creation and absorption of the photon does to the electrons doing the creating and absorbing. To get a sense of this, I want you to kind of do a thought experiment with me. Imagine that you and I are standing on skateboards. Let's say that you have a ball in your hands. If you were to throw that ball at me, two things would happen. First, since you threw the ball, you would have to recoil in the opposite direction of your throw because of something known as conservation of momentum. It's the same reason a gun will recoil when firing a bullet or an unmoored boat will move away from a dock when someone attempts to step out of it. So, throwing the ball makes you move away from me. Now, when I catch the ball, I now receive the momentum you gave the ball and I have to move backwards or away from you. If I then threw the ball back at you, this process would be able to continue with both of us speeding up away from each other. How much speed we would gain will depend on both how massive the ball is and with what velocity we throw it with. Or, another way to think of that, it would depend on how much energy we gave the ball and absorbed from the ball. That would tell us the amount of momentum we're transferring back and forth to each other. Now let's say that we could make the ball invisible and that we didn't really have to move our hands much to make the throw. To someone watching us, it would look like we were pushing each other away without having to touch, just like Newton and Coulomb's action at a distance forces in the way they described initially gravity and the electrostatic force. This is exactly what is happening between the two electrons we described just a moment ago that are emitting and absorbing photons. The photon is known as an intermediate vector boson and literally it mediates the interaction between the two electrons or any two charged objects in order to create the macroscopic phenomena we call force. Whenever you push on something with your hand, the force between you and whatever you are interacting with is actually the momentum transfer being mediated by countless photons being exchanged by the outermost electrons in the outermost atoms of your hand and the outermost electrons in the outermost atoms of the thing you're pushing on. Now, if you're driving right now, you might want to pause the podcast for a moment just to let that sink in. Don't worry, we'll wait. Okay, there are a few loose ends I need to tie up before we're finished. The first is that I used a term I haven't really defined just a moment ago. It's called the boson. So what's a boson? A boson is any particle that obeys what are known as Bose-Einstein statistics. These have been developed by the Indian physicist Sachendra Nath Bosha who in making an error during a lecture on the statistics of something known as the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for a monatomic gas, realized that this distribution would not be true for a microscopic set of particles at a scale where fluctuations would be significant and the particles would be indistinguishable from each other. He wrote up his work, but the work was originally rejected for publication. But as Boscia thought that the work would apply to photons, he sent the paper to Einstein who recognized its value and had it published. One of the key aspects of a particle that is a boson is that it has an integer spin value. Most bosons have spin values of 1, but the recently discovered Higgs boson has a value of 0. The reason that this is important is that integer spin particles are not required to obey the exclusion principle put forward by Pauli, which says that no two subatomic particles with half integer spin can share the same quantum state. As a side note, particles that had half integer spin, known as fermions, 
also have a statistical distribution that's different from either the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution or the Bose-Einstein distribution. And that distribution is known as Fermi-Dirac statistics, after the two men who would independently derive the mathematics for particles that do have to obey the exclusion principle. The difference here, by the way, is represented in quantum field theory in that while the commutation relationship for fermions is written with a minus sign between the two sets of multiplied operators, that same relationship for bosons is written with a plus sign, such as the subtlety of theoretical physics at times. The second thing, as I've mentioned in several of the biographical episodes, is that while QED, quantum electrodynamics, was pretty successful in some areas, it failed badly in others. It tended to give infinite quantities for certain calculations, something that indicated that there were real problems with the approach. These infinities could be dealt with using some creative mathematical tricks, but the approach was very much like the series of ad hoc and post hoc rules Bohr and Sommerfeld had developed for the old quantum model. Because of this, Heisenberg and Dirac both concluded that just as a revolution had been required to move quantum mechanics forward from the old quantum model of the atom, a new revolution would be required to sweep away quantum field theory and replace it with a completely new approach. It wouldn't be until Willis Lamb made a series of measurements in 1947 that physics would begin to move forward again with the development of renormalization theory, which was able to show that an entirely new theory wasn't needed, but a new form of making those corrections could be developed. Finally, the framework of quantum mechanics will serve as the model of a number of other field theory approaches to understanding what was taking place in the atom. In 1934, Fermi would develop Pauli's idea of the neutrino production by creating a field theory approach to explaining beta decay in the nucleus of the atom starting from what Heisenberg had done in 1933. The field would be called the Fermi interaction for a time until that name was changed to the weak interaction as part of the standard model. In this interaction, the intermediate vector bosons are known as the W and Z particles, while the theory is known as quantum flavor dynamics. Seriously, it is. I don't make up the names for this stuff, but it does go to show you that physicists have sort of a whimsicality about their work. The, the name, quantum flavor dynamics, has to do with the fact that an even smaller subatomic particle that we'll talk about down the road a bit something called a quark, is said to come in six, and you have to imagine me doing air quotes here, flavors. In 1935, a man by the name of Hideki Yukawa will use the field theory approach to solve another mystery. In the nucleus of the atom, we know that there are protons and neutrons by this point. The problem is, how do all the protons stay together? If like-charged particles repel each other, Heisenberg had shown in 1934 that there had to be something stronger than the electromagnetic interaction to hold the whole thing together. What Yukawa does is he works from Heisenberg's starting point and he shows that the interaction has to be something that acts only over a very short range and it has to need the neutrons as part of the mechanism in some way. Now, Yukon was an enormously bright student of our old friend Hantaro Nagaoka while a young assistant professor at Kyoto University. He postulated that there was just sort of this kind of interaction between the neutrons and protons within the nucleus. This interaction, which was called the nuclear force, would be mediated by particles he called mesons, from the Greek word mesos, which means in between because he thought that these particles should have masses somewhere in between that of the electron and the proton. The first candidate for this was known as the mu meson, or muon, and was discovered by Anderson from his cosmic ray research in 1936. However, while the particle had the right mass as predicted by Yukawa's theory, it soon became clear that the muon didn't have integer spin and actually behaved a whole lot more like an electron. It wasn't until 1947 that physicists Cecil Power, Cesar Lattes, and Giuseppe Occellini, working at the University of Bristol, 
were able to discover the correct particle, now called the pion. Yukawa would receive the Nobel Prize in 1949 for his work, becoming the first winner from Japan. Like QED, Yukawa's field theory would suffer from a number of problems and would be superseded in the standard model of the 1970s by something called the strong interaction, which explained the nuclear interaction as arising out of something known in this case is the strong force. In this formulation, quarks become the constituent building blocks of subatomic particles, and they're held together by this interaction that's about a hundred times stronger than any other interaction in nature, thus the name. The boson for this is called the gluon, and the theory is known as quantum chromodynamics. With this veritable zoo of particles, we'll conclude this part of the narrative. While I've left a few other strings dangling at this point, they'll have to remain that way for a while. The reason for this is that while all of this stuff is going on in quantum field theory, there are advances being made in understanding and modeling the nucleus of the atom beyond these field theories of Fermi and Yukawa that will be of profound importance as the world marches off to war. As I conclude this episode, let me again acknowledge my debt to the lectures of Dr. Katherine Carson at the University of California, Berkeley. These are available at iTunes U under the title HIST 181B Modern Physics. As you're already interested in the topic of modern physics and are willing to spend time listening to such esoteric topics, I think you'll find our lectures interesting and informative. Dr. Carson is a historian with a strong background in physics who's done a lot of work researching Heisenberg's development of quantum mechanics and specifically the indeterminacy or uncertainty principle. As always, thanks for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you have a minute, leave us a review with your providing service as it really helps us get the word out to everybody else that the podcast exists. Again, I'll have some supporting material for the episode up at the podcast website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com. So head over there to check that out when you have a moment. Also, special thanks to Mason Thornburg at history-podcast.com for his promotion of the show. If you'd like to find out more great history podcasts, I would recommend heading over there to get some ideas. Next time, we'll look at what happened after Rutherford's boys at the Cavendish announced that they'd split the lithium nucleus, and Chadwick completed the picture with the discovery of the neutron. In an episode tentatively titled, A Fission and Fascism, we'll trace the splitting of the atom to the development of the first atomic bomb. Until then, full sails on your journey.